Jim and Christine, come on, come on up. Let's just, uh, let's just pray before we turn the service over to the, to, to the Kellys. Jesus, we just want to thank you for the Kellys. We thank you, God, for all of the wonderful things that you're doing in and through uh, the ministry that they're part of, Lord, and through them. God, we just pray your blessing upon them as they, as they are kind of on the last leg of their tour back in, in Canada um, before they go back to the mission field, Lord. We just pray your blessing upon them. We pray that you'd protect them, Lord, that you would use them mightily of you, Lord, that the gospel would go forward in power in Thailand and in, in Asia. And for all the things that they're involved in, Lord, we just pray your blessing upon them. Um, and God, we just pray that you, you would bless them as they bring uh, the word and, and just report of what's happening overseas uh, to us this morning. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, my name is Christine. I'm the other half of Jim. Uh, we uh, we uh, were called uh, to go to Thailand and work in the Bible school 35 years ago, and we finally got there almost two years ago. Uh, sometimes the journey that uh, we are on uh, takes a different route than we anticipate. I, always, uh, I grew up always enjoying... Um, the missionaries that came to our church, and I was um, excited about what they had to say and and uh, what God was doing in these different countries. And <clears throat> at 15, God called me to be a missionary, but I didn't really know how to prepare for that. And then later on, I went to Bible school, and that's where I met this gentleman, and also uh, Clint. And um, we did missions in our home for many years in Vancouver, uh, hosting students uh, from different countries in our home. Our first two churches that we worked in were churches that were cross-cultural. One was Singaporean, Malaysian, Filipino, and the second one was Korean. So we've had a little tiny bit of exposure to different cultures. And the one big thing I want to bring out this morning is that we don't take our culture over to another country and enforce it on people. We take our Jesus and we tell them about him and the difference that he makes. Um, how does this work? Um, how many of you have heard about the 1040 window? Sorry, my 1040 window is there. It's the red part of the um, globe where they are the least reached and the most vulnerable people in the world. Japan and Thailand um, are the most difficult places in the world to reach. So if you have uh, people that you know in those two countries, really pray for them because the people um, need Jesus. In our part of the world, it's the gold part, um, the major majority, or 95% of the people, are Buddhist. And uh, to be Buddhist is to be Thai, to be Thai is to be Buddhist. And it's so deeply interwoven um, into their being that to leave your Buddhism behind is a really, really difficult thing to do. Thailand is a little tiny country, um, the little butterfly part there, if you can't read the word Thailand, uh, it fits into Canada 19 times and has 72 million people. Uh, we live in Bangkok and there are 16 million people, so there's always some sort of noise going on. and. Um, it's been quite the change from moving from tiny Abbotsford to 16 million people. The major religion is Buddhism. 95% of Thais are Buddhist. 40,000 temples where you can go to um, make merit and um, gain favor and hopefully 
um, come back in another life as something better than you were before. Um, on a bus, if you are sitting on a bus, you will find that it says this seat is for monks, for the disabled, mothers with children, pregnant women, and the elderly. And a woman may not touch a monk. So if a monk wants that seat, everyone else moves. <coughs> um, you can, your, if you give the monks um, some sort of gift, they will um, give you a blessing. Whether the blessing is for your business, or for your home, or for um, a sick person, uh, they do have that built into their religion. These are the spirit houses that are in front of every building that is belongs to a Buddhist, um, or uh, so a business or um, a residence. And this is where you bring offerings so that the evil spirits will not come into your home or your business, but they will be pacified outside your home. These are amulets, and the more important the monk is who has prayed over your amulet, the more expensive it will, expensive it will be. Uh, some of the Thai values that we've noticed and have become aware of are self-control, non-confrontational attitude. Um, those are the two big ones. Self-control, people always wear a mask. They always smile. Um, they never show you their true feelings, and they're very stoic. So you will see people who um, might be navigating trauma, a grief of a loss of a loved one, but they will never speak about it, and they will never show it. Everything is always fine. Um, the non-confrontational attitude, you don't confront somebody and you never resolve problems. So we're learning to um, figure this out and apply the Bible, what the Bible teaches in relation to what the culture teaches. Uh, in regards to self-control in the year, um, almost two years that we've been there, we've heard the honk of a vehicle twice. No one loses their cool. And so if you can imagine driving in, the <coughs> driving in the city of 16 million people and there's no horns, everybody's very polite, very controlled. If somebody drifts into your lane and kind of cuts you off, um, it's no big deal. You just deal with it. Nobody gets upset. Nobody slams on their brakes. Nobody um, sits on their horn. Nobody gets out with a baseball bat to... Um, beat on somebody else. Um, I see some snickers going on here. I, uh, I lived in the Lower Mainland for about 30 years, so um, I have a few <coughs> experiences. And um, what else was I going to say? I lost my notes this morning, by the way. So I'm just going to ad living here. <laughs> oh, we asked one of the girls that um, is our Thai interpreters, we said, um, how is it that nobody gets upset when, when somebody else cuts them off? And she says, oh, it's probably because you did it to somebody just a few minutes ago. And so uh, people are very easygoing. And the Thai have 13 different smiles. I can't tell you what they all are, but uh, they smile a lot. Oh, that's, I know now what I was going to say. You never challenge the government. You never defame the government. If you do, you will end up in prison. It also boils down to stepping on the image of the king. If your money is blowing down the street, you dare not step on it. You can run, but you can't step on it because I would be dis disgracing the king. Disgrace the king in Thailand. We have the most 7-Elevens of anywhere in the world. There are 14,000 of them, and we also have the claim to fame of the largest 7-Eleven in the world. 
you can actually eat at a 7-Eleven. They will prepare hot meals for you um, that you buy off the shelf. And so you could probably just live in a 7-Eleven. So many 7-Elevens and not a slurpy machine in sight. Did you hear the oh? <laughs> Uh, Thailand also has the most pickup trucks per capita. I chose the most outrageous photos that I could find, but this, these are not unheard of. Um, the little red truck is what we ride between our condo that we rent and the Sky Train. And uh, trucks are used for everything. They even have uh, truck um, races um, and huge race tracks if anybody's into racing pickups. Thailand has the most trucks per capita compared to anywhere else in the world. We thought we had them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, when I teach them about Canada, they cannot conceive that uh, Canada is over 5,000 miles across. Just n does not compute. And that we have three, uh, four seasons, and the seasons each are very significantly different from each other. These words up here on the um, overhead are people's names. And each person has a nickname that is absolutely unrelated to their name. So if you know somebody's nickname, you don't usually know their full name. Um, usually your teacher in school knows your full name and your parents, and maybe once you're about six or seven years old, then you might know your full name. But the, low, the, um, the one at the bottom is Tanya Torn Chat Long. She lived with us uh, about 22 years ago, and um, her nickname is Pear, because her mom liked pears while she was pregnant. And so all the other kids in her family, the four younger siblings, each have a name that starts with P. Um, and different, we've heard of uh, Pancake. Um, we have a, fr a guy at Bible school whose name is Film, F-I-L-M. And because he hasn't graduated yet, he's an underdeveloped film. <laughs> and the beauty of this humor, no one can understand it in Thailand. When you translate a joke, it, 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 does, it just falls flat. It loses everything. Um, and then the girl who was the youth leader, uh, national youth leader in Thailand for 10 years, her name was Chipmunk. Because she has the energy of one. That too. Uh, so yes, people get their nicknames uh, for various reasons. And I just have one... Um, story to tell before I hand the mic over to my husband. Um, I get the privilege of uh, teaching conversational English at the Bible School, um, also one-on-one -on -one with the students who want to improve their English. English became the trade language, or was declared the trade language in 2017 for Southeast Asia, which is 11 countries. And so the there's a, people are encouraged to learn English, and the people who speak English get the better paying jobs. So. Our Thai has not gone very far yet. Um, we definitely need a bit more work on that. Um, I can't even hold a, a, a basic conversation with anybody yet. Uh, the girl who's circled there, her name is Kitty, and she comes to the Wednesday night Bible study that I get to be a part of. I am the token white face that speaks English, so that's an attractant to come to the Bible study where they speak English. And Kitty is Buddhist. All of these people in this group here is are, or were. Yeah, let's wait. All of these people, except for two of them, uh, three of them are from a Buddhist background. And um, they are either new believers or pre believers. And they are so vibrant. Kitty um, had been used as a drug mule in a very abusive relationship. She had been released from prison in a different country and came home. She was Buddhist. She didn't know anything about God. People in Thailand believe that um, Christmas is Santa's birthday. Uh, that's as far as they get. And so it's a great opportunity for people to invite their friends um, at Christmas time. Um, to come meet Jesus or learn about Jesus. But Kitty um, had God speak to her 
she didn't know who he was, but he told her that she would be, um, he was going to use her to help heal a man. And Kitty says, okay. And uh, a few uh, weeks later, um, she, um, she's in Phuket, one of the tourist towns, which is her hometown, and God points out the man that she's going to help heal. And she says, not that one, he's a foreigner. <laughs> and uh, foreigners are, have um, um, not always been the most gracious in the host country that they're visiting. But this man was very, very sick. And Kitty, before she even knew Jesus, um, she took all her wealth. And in an Asian culture, your wealth is what you're given in gold on your wedding day. She took all her gold. She sold it to buy medicine for this man that God had told her she would heal. And it reminds me of the story of the lady who took her alabaster jar and broke it and washed Jesus' feet. And so Kitty comes to know Jesus, and I meet her on, on the first night at, um, at the Wednesday night Bible study after she's um, made a commitment to follow Jesus. And she says, as a Buddhist, I gave from the outside, because Buddhist, you must give, right? Everything good that you do, you gain merit. She says, but now, and I'm not exaggerating when I go into the dramatics here. She says, but now it gushes out of me. And I thought, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I finally got it. After 63 years, I finally got it. I finally understood the meaning. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And uh, this is Kitty. And uh, the man that um, is standing behind her is the man that God is using. Uh, she has been used to help heal. He's still got a long way to go. They're married now. And she just got baptized on one of the Sundays before we left to come over here. Thank you, Christine. The gentleman behind her that she healed, his name is Trevor. He was a missionary in Indonesia. And he'd been there for a number of years, and he got wind of a, an illegal mining operation that he turned into the government. So he was arrested and imprisoned because he turned in an illegal mining operation that was exploiting the people. He spent a number of years in prison. He was broken in many different ways. He's had malaria, what, 34 times? The enemy is out to get servants. But you want to know something? Now, I'll be honest with you. I read the back of the book. We win. And our God is bigger. There are many amazing things going over on, over on, in, on over in Asia. My syntax is beginning to cr go crazy. My wife had mentioned that we're having problems learning Thai. Well, Thai is a tonal language. It has five tones. Mid-tone, low tone, rising tone, high tone, falling tone. Every word is impacted by the tones, and I'm just going to give you three. Cow, cow, cow. What I just said was nine, white, rice. Now that can become difficult when you're going home and I'm trying to tell the cab driver that I live at Soi Urumsok, he sip cow. He might turn to me and he go, you live at 20 rice? Why would you live at 20 rice? Or 20 white, what's 20 white? I have to make sure I get the, the uh, tones right so that I can go home. But there are five tones. So whenever we're trying to learn a word and you, you watch the person you're talking to go, Okay, I didn't get the tone right on that one. Try again. But I'm here to explain a little bit of our mission. What are we doing over there? We're your missionaries over there. So let me make one thing perfectly clear. We are not doing it. We are doing it. You're part of the team. You are part of what's going on over in Southeast Asia where we are. Now, what we're doing it did work. It worked for Christine. Wait a minute. I know how this works. 
I had an old TV with the, the, the rabbit ears. I know you gotta... <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Anyways, we're disciple, we're involved in making disciple makers. This is our purpose being over there. We're not there just to imprint with Western culture. That's been done in different places over the world. In some places it's worked, in some places it really hasn't. One of the neat things is that we see in Kenya that they have taken the mission over there and they have taken ownership of it. And in this ownership, they have their, their churches over there that have their, a recognizable church, but it des- definitely has a Kenyan flavor to it. And that's what we're trying to make sure happens in Thailand as well. They don't need any Western or Thai-speaking Western churches. They need churches that reflect who they are in Jesus Christ to their own culture. That's the best way to bring them in. My wife had mentioned that 95% of Thailand is Buddhist. The other majority are uh, Muslim. Now, there has been reported that 2% of Thailand is Christian. But those are the majority uh, of those are the tribal people up north in the northern part of Thailand. The ethnically Thai people, the number is closer to 0.02%. And that's because it's ingrained in each and every one of them that to be Thai is to be Buddhist. And to be Buddhist is to be... To convert from Buddhism is almost seen as high treason against their government and king. So it's ingrained them not to convert. So this is the environment with which we work. And, but I'll tell you what, when they convert, well, God does some pretty cool things. We have, um, I'm gonna tell a couple of stories as we go. One of the stories is about a young lady that was in one of Christine's classes. Her name was Quan. Her mother was a, uh, a singer in a, a nightclub which usually included, in Thailand, other duties. Her father was a gangster. She was raised by an aunt, became a Christian. And now, after she's graduated with her master's degree, she is now working in the red light district in Bangkok, helping girls get out of human trafficking. So this is the impact that is being had over there when the gospel hits hearts. Now, we are equipping disciple makers And I'm going to be working out of a text this morning. I'll touch on a couple of texts. But the primary text is from Exodus chapter 19. And it's verses 5 and 6. And the text reads, and I'll have it up there later, but I want to begin with it right now. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my commandment, then out of all the nations you will be a treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. Now, let, let me, the whole earth is mine. The whole earth belongs to our God. He says, out of those, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the Israelites. Father, as we look into your word this morning, we pray that you through your Holy Spirit would quicken to our hearts and minds everything that you need us to hear for our own ministries here and for ministries abroad. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, each and every one of us are called to be prophets and priests. Oh, what, what's a priest or a prophet? Oh, does that mean we have to go around wearing those weird clothes, eating grasshoppers and wild honey? Oh, yeah, somebody over there, grasshoppers, come to, come to Thailand, we'll get you grasshoppers and all sorts of other insects. There's bug markets there where you buy them for food. Christine wants to go. I'm good with chicken. <laughs> I really am. <clears throat> but a prophet is somebody who proclaims God to the people. Anytime you talk to somebody who does not understand clearly who Jesus is, you're acting prophetically, especially if God has put them on your heart. That's a prophetic action. When you're praying about that person before God, that is a priestly action. A priest represents the people to God. They offer the sacrifices. They're the ones that that, uh, uh, conduct the services in the temple. But the prophet is the one who communicates. We are called to be both. 
Now, Jesus Christ is unique. He is the prophet, priest, and king, the high priest. But we are called to be prophets and priests. We're called to be his hands and feet in our generation, both in 100 Mile House, uh, uh, the Caribou region, Western Canada, and the utmost ends of the earth. Now, there's a reason I did those three, and I'll touch on those in just a minute. So as I said, prophets and priests were to stand as intermediators between God and an unbelieving generation that we're in in this world. And we've been in that position for 2,000 years. Now, as a member of the community of faith, we have to fulfill this, this, this role of being prophet and priest. And let me just add something. You have a gift from God right here, right now. Actually, you've got a number of gifts. Anybody who's involved in teaching, preaching, and leadership is God's gift to this church. Because in Ephesians 4.11, the Bible says that Christ himself gave uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the purpose of equipping God's people for works of service. The pastors... The elders, the deacons, their job is not to do the ministry of the church. Their job is to equip the prophets and the priests, all of us, to do the ministry in the church, to impact Hunter Mile House, the Caribou, Western Canada, and to the utmost ends of the earth. And like I said, I use that pattern for a particular purpose. Now, We've gone over Exodus, that we are called to be this, this kingdom of priests, a holy nation. What makes us holy? It's not my sense of humor. As a matter of fact, when I crack a joke in a class or in a sermon in Thailand, the interpreter will say something, everybody laughs, and I'm figuring, they got it. And afterwards, the term, uh, my translator will turn to me and say, I told them you were trying to be funny and they should laugh. <laughs> Every time and there's five interpreters that I work with and they all say the same thing I think they're plotting against me but anyways we're not called to make converts nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're called to make converts that's the Holy Spirit's job we're there to explain to them who exactly Jesus Christ is And there's a lot of confusion about that in the world today. Some people think um, he's uh, uh, Santa's father. That's crazy. If you're a Buddhist, you believe that he is a Buddha Vista. He's somebody that's achieved enlightenment and come back to teach others. If you're a Hindu, you believe he's an incarnation of their god, Vishnu. If you're a Muslim, you believe that he's just another prophet but he's not these things. He is Lord God Almighty, creator, redeemer. He's the one that spoke into the darkness and caused the light to shine. And he is that light that shines in the darkest heart to redeem them to himself. This is our God. So missions actually begins in home. My wife had told you that we had um, had homestay students. We often argue about it. Uh, I say there was some, uh, somewhere between 60 and 70. She says 40. Anyways, we had a lot of kids go through our home. Every one of them was exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of them didn't accept the gospel. Others did. As a matter of fact, in 2018, we were invited to go to Taiwan for a, a wedding one of our girls who accepted Christ was getting married. And we're trying to say, yeah, that's a little bit expensive. You know, we really can't go. She says, well, you have to. You're performing the ceremony. (laughs) (laughs) That's exciting news. Thank you. (laughs) Wish I'd known. (laughs) Anyways, after the ceremony, I did a traditional Western ceremony. And afterwards, everybody was coming up to me going, that was so beautiful. That was so wonderful. You've got to write that down. As Clint would know, yeah, there's like, it's in a lot of books we have over here. I just kind of copy and pasted, sorry. (laughs) But modern missions takes three different texts and 
puts them together. Now the texts, one is from Genesis 12, 3, going into the Old Testament, Matthew 28, 19, and Acts 1, 8. In Genesis 12, 3, as God is establishing the Abrahamic covenant, he says that he is going to bless nations because of Abraham, and that nations would be blessed because Abraham was there. That blessing is Jesus Christ. That's what it's referring to. That's a messianic prophecy, but it also speaks to wherever we are, people are blessed because the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We are representatives of the living God in their midst. And whether they believe or not, they are actually blessed when we are there. That's an important thing to remember. But it also goes on is because we are called to disciple them. That's where Matthew 28 and 19 comes in. It doesn't say we're to come in and make everybody con converts, because we can't do that. Who here has ever been able to successfully force somebody to change their mind? No hands. I've been married 35 years. My wife has tried with me for a long time. My skull is just too thick, and she will tell you that. I happen to have a genetic um, disposition that means I don't change my mind very often. I'm Irish. So that, that's a problem. But then it comes into um, Acts 1.8. And this is where Jesus says, wait, you will be empowered and you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's why I gave the pattern. 100 Mile House, uh, Central British Columbia, Western Canada, and to the ends of the earth. I'm properly applying this text into our situation right here, today, right now. It's the same meaning, and it's applicable. This is what we are called to do. Now, in going overseas, one of the things we do, we work with a, a, a fellowship over there. Christine, do you know what the fellowship is? She always gets the first word wrong, so I kind of pick on her. I know I'm a horrible person. Bad missionary. It's called the Full Gospel Assemblies of Thailand. And it is uh, an organization that is about, uh, about 60 years old now. Um, the first three missionaries from Canada that went over there all perished. The first one was in a car accident. They came back to Canada to raise funds and they were in a car accident here. They were killed. The person who replaced them was on their way out to prison ministry in Thailand with two other um, Canadian missionaries and, uh, what was it, four? No, five Thai nationals in a van. And they were in a horrific car accident. All three Canadian missionaries were killed. Uh, uh, three of the, um, the Thai nationals were killed. Two of the Thai nationals survived. One of them, his name is Ajahn, which means Pastor Desha. He stands this tall. For once, I feel so tall over there. But he stands this tall. And when I met him, he came up to me, told me who he was, and he stomped his feet and he says, and I still serve Jesus today. Because he's still preaching the gospel. Because he will not let anything get in the way of communicating Christ. But we come alongside them and we serve with them. We're not there to try to force them to be something that we think they should be. There's a song by a, a, a Christian a musicians group out of South Africa, and it says, we don't need a shirt and tie. And I'll tell you what, 35 degree heat, 45 degree heat, 49 degree heat, 100% humidity, I don't need a shirt and tie either. Well, a shirt, yes, but not the tie. I was gonna make a, a joke about the tie people and ties, but I won't, because that's just bad. So what we're doing is we're trying to build authentic communities of faith and coming alongside of them. And what we're doing is we're there to serve. And actually, this is one of my translators, Dr. Pete. And he's the first one that did that to me. He's trying to be funny, just laugh. He's a good brother and I love him. But we're also there building the church. We're working in a seminary. I'm working on developing English language programs because, as my wife has told you, the English language is now the trade language. 
I'm there to, to develop uh, um, or to teach at the undergraduate or bachelor's level. I'm developing programs at the master's level as well as developing a Master of Divinity program for the seminary, as well as developing their online teaching platform and <laughs> working on getting them accredited with different theological associations so that their credits are transferable around the world. We're becoming a world-class seminary. So we work with these at the Thailand Pentecostal Seminary. Oh, before I go there, this is Ajahn Pad. Ajahn Pad came to um, the United States. He was an engineer who had aspirations of becoming a Buddhist monk. But while he was working in Texas, he encountered somebody. It's a person that we're all familiar with, Jesus. And then he got involved in prison ministry. So now he's the prison chaplain in Thailand. And these are some of the boys that he has led to Christ who were hardcore federal type criminals that we would have in our system here, who have all come to Christ. The government has recognized they've changed, they've been released, many of which are pursuing trying to get into ministry so that they can serve Jesus Christ. We serve alongside these gentlemen. We do not lead. We, we do not try to force them to do anything. We work with them because this is their country. Now building Thai leaders. So we work within the seminary and we're teaching these courses. My wife teaches English and she's able to, to help the, the students understand uh, more of English. Why should they learn English? Really, should they learn English? It's their country. On average in North America, anywhere between 6,000 to 20,000 new books in the Christian uh, genre are published every year. New books. In Thailand, it's somewhere between 100 and 200 that are being translated. For them to learn English opens up the opportunity for them to learn enormously. At this point in time, in the library in Thailand, we have over 13,000 books, 7,000 of which are in English, the rest are in Thai. And the students try to work with the English books. But it's a struggle because sometimes the way uh, uh, English syntax works, uh, it doesn't work with them. For example, they don't have a, a, a time tense. We have future, past, and present tense. They don't have those in Thai. They're not, they're not there at all. So when they read it in English, they struggle to understand it but with Christine's help, they're getting there. And I see that in some of their assignments when I get them. And it, it's exciting to watch as they learn and learn more. So what we're doing over there is working within the classrooms. And here is a class. This gentleman is Sang Chai. He's one of my uh, translators. He's also going to be the senior pastor of the oldest FGAT church in Thailand. And he's a very good friend. This gentleman here in the front in the white shirt. Actually, his name was on one of my wife's uh, slides. Did you see the film at the bottom? And I said he was an underdeveloped film? That's film. Right there. So th it's an actual person. This is Chai. Now, Chai in India is a, a tea drink with milk. So a tea drink. In Thailand, chai means yes. So I asked him if he's a yes man, because his name is yes. And they roll their eyes when I make jokes. And I don't know why. In one of my other classes, I have a, a young lady by the name of Mint. And I, I t said to one day, I says, if I talk to you after supper, are you an after dinner Mint? And she's like, oh. Pray for the Thai, they have to deal with my humor. And this is Christine's class, whoops, going back. This is Christine's classroom as she's teaching them. This is Ann, Bonus, and Esther. Esther and her husband are already in ministry. They are helping to replant a church 
that was closed down because of COVID. And they are replanting it in northern Thailand. Uh, An? An is up in the northeast, is he not? Up beyond uh, Udon Thani. Don't be impressed. I've just heard that name so often I can actually say it. And he's up there planting, again, a church that was closed down. As our bonus here, she is still in class and still working towards finishing. And what we're trying to do there is discipling leaders to create culturally relevant communities of faith. Thai churches that communicate the gospel clearly so that other Thai can understand and be drawn to Jesus Christ. We're there to build. And sometimes that includes having some interesting conversations. Now, usually in the Thai culture, they do not ask questions in class. Has anybody here ever been to a classroom before? Hope all of us have at some point. And have you ever asked a question? I'm the guy that would ask the dumb question to see if I could trip up the teacher, right? Anyways, in Thailand, they don't. I have to bribe them to ask questions. Because if you ask a, a teacher a question, you're assuming the teacher didn't do a good job teaching you in the first place. So that's a hard one to get around. And I've had to work with it. But we have had some students from uh, Asia that have asked us some interesting questions. This is Vivian. She was one of our homestay students. This is the young lady whose wedding we did in Taiwan. When she was staying with us, I was working on my master's degree. She came into my office one evening and she says, Jim, can I ask you a question? I said, of course. Now, I'm expecting, as a homestay student, she's going to ask me, where are the extra towels? Or where do we keep the toilet paper? Or Kleenex, or something along those lines. So I'm typing a paper for a professor. I've got a, I'm just starting a paper, 10 pages, 6 o'clock at night. It's due 8 a.m. the next morning for a very difficult professor at the master's level. A lot of work ahead of me. She comes in and she asks, can I ask a question? I said, sure. How do you tell the difference between your soul's voice, the voice of the books you read, and the voice of God? I remember looking at my computer and thinking, I'm never finishing this. (laughs) It's not happening. And then I quietly prayed, Father, you promised wisdom when we asked and when we trust you. So Father, I need your wisdom right now and I'm trusting you for it. And I looked back over at her and I said, Vivian, when you first moved in and you called on the phone, did you recognize my voice? She goes, no. If you called now on the phone, would you recognize my voice? Well, yes. I said, why? Because I know you, we've got a relationship. There's your answer. You understand God's voice when you're in a relationship with him as you get to know him. And she, oh, thank you, and off she went. And I'm sitting there looking at my computer going, where did that come from? (laughs) Oh, thank you, Jesus. Now, the lady on the other side here is Kanon. She's one of uh, our friends from Thailand. Well, actually, she's just moved to the United States. She met a nice American man who she's going to get married to. Uh, She was baptized about a year ago. She came to me at a camp and she goes, Jim, how do you understand God's voice to follow it? And I said, first of all, you need to develop an intense relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to get into his word and get his word into you. You need to spend time in his presence in prayer, talking to him. But at the same time, you also have to learn how to stop talking and just listen to God. Oh, okay. What was it? Three weeks later that she came and said, it works, it works, it works. I'm hearing God. If any of you are having problems ever hearing from God, get into the word, get the word into you. Spend time in his presence in prayer. That includes worship. And sometimes just stopping 
with the word in front of you and allow God to speak because our God will. And finally, we are working throughout South and Southeast Asia. We're working with a program called the Ministry Essentials Training Program. If you look in your bulletin, the little blurb right up on us, and this is uh, um, a number that has been triple checked many times. Only 5% of pastors globally have any theological training. That means 95% of pastors who are hearing the call from God, trying to lead churches without really having any idea of what they're doing. So a friend of ours came up with a program called the Ministry Essentials Training Program, or MEP. What it is, it's a 12-module program that we are introducing uh, literally around the world to train pastors and lay leaders so that they have the tools and the knowledge to be able to lead God's people effectively. At this point in time, it is in uh, 10 or 11 countries in Africa. It's in South America. It's in Europe. Um, it's going throughout Asia. Now, this program, and here is uh, the college where I teach. Um, this is my boss. Um, his name is uh, Ajahn Anan. He is the uh, uh, dean of uh, students. No, academic dean, sorry. He has just finished training all of these other uh, teachers to teach this program throughout Thailand. Thailand is teaching this program into Norway, Germany, France, Belgium, Australia, the United States, because many Thais have gone over there to work, and now they're planting churches in these countries. I told you about Desha. The little guy who is in the car accident, that's him. And he is a fireball. He is such an awesome guy. But the MEPP program is being taught in countries, and it's designed to be taught in countries where the gospel is not appreciated. And there are a few of those. MEPP is taking the gospel in where Satan and everything he can bring to bear is trying to keep it out. But you want to know something? The church is growing. Why? Because our God cannot be stopped. And he's touching lives. And he's calling them to himself. And he's redeeming them. And he's giving them hope and a life and a future. One of our, our, our graduates, he says, I have been, I'm a businessman, and I have been uh, uh, pastoring a church for 10 years. He says, now I have the knowledge I need. So we're working in all nations. I'm going to wrap up in just a second, and everybody said yes and amen. But this I want to leave you with. We often come to church because we want to see God move. And years ago, I had somebody ask me, says, Pastor, why don't we see miracles in the church anymore, signs and wonders? My response was, stop looking for the signs and wonders. Start looking for the sign maker, for the wonder maker. Look for the God who does this stuff. Forget the tricks. Oh, but pastors, those aren't tricks. Those are miracles. Well, actually, Jesus did say that greater things we would do. So let's look at a comparison. When Jesus healed the blind man, other than spitting on the dirt and putting it in his eyes, how did he heal him? Jesus said, see. When he spoke to the deaf man, how did he heal him? He spoke to him. He said, hear. When he was dealing with the lame man, what did he do? He spoke. He said, rise. When he was dealing with Lazarus or Jairus' daughter, what did he say? Jairus' daughter, get up, to Lazarus, come forth. He spoke. When he brought the world into existence, what did he do? He spoke. But for a human life to cross over from death unto life, into a relationship with the living God, 
it took 39 lashes, six hours on a cross, nine, or excuse me, three iron spikes, one crown of thorns, three days in a tomb, one stone rolled away, and he rose. Greater things will we do every time you disciple somebody for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're part of the greatest miracle creation has ever seen. Invite you into that part of the journey. Thank you for partnering with us. You are already involved in this happening in Thailand. You are vital members of our team. We desire prayer because sometimes we go into these dangerous countries. Most of the time we're in Thailand, which is absolutely safe. It's a sea of tranquility amongst all the chaos around it. But sometimes we, we, we do have to go in to train, to equip, to make partnerships. We cover your prayers so desperately. If you pray for us and God be for us, nobody can stand against and we will see his kingdom continue to grow. Amen? So as I said, we're there serving, building all nations. And this program, we're already encouraging people here in Canada to get involved with the MEPP program. So I had to report myself. I said, I'm stepping out of our boundary a little bit. My boss said, go for it. And as many as we can equip for the gospel of Christ, the better. Pastor Clint.